Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another installment of Bringing the Zoo to You. My name is Dr. Jennifer Watts, and I'm the Director of Nutrition here at Brookfield Zoo. We're actually really lucky to have a nutrition program. We were one of the first zoos to have a nutrition program over 35 years ago. And because there's only about 25 of us that have graduate degrees in nutrition and work at zoos, so it was a very, very small amount of us, um, despite knowing how important nutrition is. So today what we're going to do is we're going to go over some of the foods that we feed the animals, some of the different uh, types of animals that we have, and then we're going to ask them some questions. Unfortunately, I have to put a little disclaimer out that I cannot answer questions about what a specific animal or species eats because that's going to take a long time to answer. Um, hopefully I'll answer your questions as I'm going through my talk. So, the first thing we're going to talk about is herbivores. Now herbivores, if you remember, if you know, are animals that eat plants. So what's really important in their diet is hay. And here we have two different kinds of hay. This up here is alfalfa hay, and you can see the dried leaves in here. Um, this is what we feed to our browsers, like giraffe, okapi, reindeers, and llamas. They are browsers, so they pick fresh leaves, like if you think about a giraffe eating acacia, they just take the leaf part. So their diet is very high in protein, and the, so alfalfa is a better uh, product for them to, to eat. And then down here we have grass hay. You can see it looks very different than the alfalfa hay, and this is what we feed to our grazers. So grazers are like big lawn mowers, and they just eat and eat and eat all types of grass. The, these guys need a little bit higher fiber because grass is usually higher in fiber and lower in protein. And so this, we have several different kinds of grass hay, but this is a Timothy, uh, Timothy grass mixed hay with some other uh, grasses in it. Now, unfortunately, hay is not nutritionally complete. So what we do for almost all of our animals is we feed them a complete formulated diet. And that's similar, you'll see, to some diets that you might be familiar with. Here we have an, one of our herbivore pellets. So it's just a little pellet that's made up of uh, corn, soy, wheat, um, and all the vitamins and minerals that the animals need. So that's really important because the hay does not provide all the vitamins and minerals that the animals need. So this is fed to our bison, our zebra, our clip springers, everybody who eats mostly plant matter will get these kinds of pellets. The only exception to that is our rhinos. They get a much bigger pellet, and that's partly due to their size, but also this is a special pellet because black rhinos, which are the rhinos that we have here at Brookfield Zoo, have a problem with storing too much iron. And so we have to make special diets that are very low in iron to make sure that we keep them healthy and don't have that problem with too much iron. Now moving along down here, we're gonna go up here. These are some of our primate diets. Now the primates, we have lots of different kinds because we don't want them to get bored. These, these biscuits are kind of boring, although the animals really like them. Um, we wouldn't want their whole diet to be just the biscuits. But we also don't want them to get, have to eat the same thing every single day. If you had to eat pizza every single day, you'd get kind of bored of it. So we have ones that are different in size. This one actually is a, an orange flavor. This is an apple flavor. This is for our smaller primates. So all different kinds of things, and we rotate them daily. So on one day they may get this one, the next day they get this one, and so on, so that way they um, don't get bored with their diets. So these are complete diets, again, and they provide all the vitamins and minerals. One of the problems with these is that they're very calorically dense. That means they've got a lot of energy. And if the animals eat a lot of it, they could get, uh, they could get overweight. So we use as little of these as possible to meet their nutritional needs, and then fill their diets up with other items that they would eat, like produce or greens and other types of things to make sure that their diet is varied. These are now different kinds of carnivore diets. Now these here are specialized carnivore diets made for insect eaters. So you can see these are very, very teeny tiny pellets because some of our 
insectivorous animals don't have teeth and they just use their sticky tongue to get their food. So these little pellets stick to their tongue very nicely and they're able to consume the pellet. This is actually our very special pangolin diet. It's made up of ground up bugs. And this again is something that we can crumble into little pieces and then they can, they can eat it um, by sticking out their tongue and using their sticky tongue to um, grab it. These are some, although you don't recognize exactly what they are, but this is cat food and dog food. So we use the same kind of brands of food that you would use at home for your cat and dog. And we use these sometimes for our bears, which are omnivorous animals, so they eat both plants and animal matter. Uh, cat food goes to our meerkats, our bad-eared foxes, um, and all the other kinds of omnivorous and carnivorous animals that we have here at the zoo. So then moving on, we don't want to forget about our bird and her friends. So we have a couple different complete diets here as well. So this you might recognize is kind of like a parakeet diet. It's got seeds and little bits of complete diet in it. That's the red, yellow, and green parts. And that's really important to have because it's really not a good idea to feed just seeds to your birds. That'll actually make them very sick. So we wanna make sure that they've got complete diet also in their mix. This is a diet that we make for our frugivorous birds. Frugivorous means fruit eating. So what we do is we have chopped up apple, beets, carrots, oranges, papaya, strawberries, all kinds of different fruits and vegetables. And then we coat it with the pellet that we want them to eat. So hopefully when they eat a blueberry, they'll also get some of that complete diet that we want them to eat to help keep them healthy. And then down here we have some reptile turtle sticks. These actually will float for our turtle friends. And this again is another complete diet that provides all the vitamins and minerals that they'll need. Moving on, once we fill their diet up with the complete diet items, we can then move on and fill up our herbivorous animals with some produce. So I put different kinds of items that we, we feed here. We feed lots and lots of greens. This is only four different kinds. So we've got butterhead, romaine, kale, and spinach. But we have about seven or eight different kinds of greens. And just like with our chows for our primates, we also rotate these around so that they don't eat the same thing every day. I put a lot of vegetables down here because vegetables are really, really important for our animals. The, um, the thing is, is that we've domesticated fruit, so we eat animals that would normally eat fruit in the wild, their fruit is much different than our fruit, and actually vegetables are a much better substitute for fruit than uh, our fruits. But we do feed them as treats. You can see we've got strawberries, we've got watermelons. We actually give watermelons to our bears. They love to play with them. And lots of other different kinds of fruits, exotic fruits. We also have papaya and mango and guava and all sorts of things. But you'll see a lot of stuff that you recognize and probably um, eat yourself. So that's really kind of cool. So now we've talked about our herbivores and our omnivores. So now it's time to go over to carnivores. So carnivores are our meat eaters. All of our carnivores get a complete diet just like the biscuits, but it has all, so it has all the vitamins and minerals that they need. So this is a, a tube of meat. It comes, it comes to us like this and it's got all the vitamins and minerals that the animals need. So they'll get this uh, diet most days of the week. On some days of the week, we actually give them bones. So this is a bone that has meat on it. You can see the bone right here. And then this is a bone without meat on it, so it's been shaved. We give these to the animals as a way to help them clean their teeth. Cats, in particular, just like your domestic cat, doesn't like, they don't like rawhides. So we have to give them real bones to chew on. And the reason we do that is because the meat diet that we have is very soft and that cannot break off the tartar that can uh, accumulate on their teeth. So we give them the bones as a way to help their dental health. We also have what are called 
piscivores, which are our fish eaters. So one of the things you're gonna see as I talk a little bit about our carnivores is that we have so many different kinds of carnivores, we have to have different sizes of prey. So these are little silver sides. They're only about three to four inches long, very skinny, and we'll use these for our ibises, um, our spoonbills, egrets, some of our storks, anything that's got a little bit of a smaller bill and a smaller gape that need to eat small fish. This is called a capelin. It is a medium-sized fish. We use this for a lot of different animals like our penguins, our uh, dolphin, our sea lions, and any other kind of fi fishing cats, otters, all those guys will get capelin. This is a herring. So you can see it's much, much bigger. And we'll use that. We'll cut it up usually for our otters and uh, dolphins and sea seals and sea lions. But the difference between these and what's important for us when we're feeding our, our marine mammals is that the capelin is very lean. It doesn't have a lot of fat. The herring actually is a lot fatter. So if we have to work with how much we have to feed them based on calories, we can change the ratio of these fish and get the right calories and help our animals grow. We have lots of different things we use for enrichment. So sometimes for treats, our animals will get shrimp, the otters, the fishing cats, uh, and some other piscivorous animals. And we'll also give our otters clams. And they'll do just like they do in the wild and crack them open and get the meat that's on the inside. So now for those of you that are a little bit squeamish, we're moving on to some of our other whole prey items. Um, that's my little warning for you guys. So one of the things that we do feed live here are insects. So these are two different types of worms. On the left, you can see these are wax worms. These are a higher fat, higher protein worm that we use for a lot of our birds when, they're, when they have chicks in the nest and also for animals that we may need to have gained some weight and other items have not worked. On the right, we have mealworms. These come in many different sizes, and we feed these to all of our insectivorous animals almost daily. Um, they get, this is a really good treat for most of our animals. They usually love them. We also have crickets. I unfortunately didn't get any crickets today, um, but we have many different sizes of crickets from what's called a pinhead, which is actually really just the size of a pinhead, all the way up to our one inch adult crickets. The pinheads and fruit flies and little bugs like that are used for our poison dart frogs and other little small animals that need those little bugs. And then the crickets we feed out to a lot of animals. One of the nice things with using these live is it encourages activity with our animals. So they'll move around to try to catch the prey and it keeps them active and moving around their exhibit. We also have some vertebrate prey. So here we have Again, different sizes because we have different sized predators. These are little pinky mice that are only about a day old, and these are for very small snakes, lizards, and um, some small mammals. Most of our animals will get a regular mouse, so this is just a regular mouse. We also have a very large rat. Um, those will be for our bigger snakes, sometimes for our larger carnivores, and um, we have quail, which are used for some specific cats that are more uh, bird eaters than they are um, rodent or other types of vertebrate prey. And then we also have a specialized kind of prey item. This is a little anole. And these are special for our Micronesian kingfishers, which are a very special bird. And during their breeding season, they really prefer the anoles. So we make sure to have them available so that they're able to breed and want to do the behaviors that they would like to do. One of the other things that we have in terms of prey for our wolves is we actually use white-tailed deer. We are trying to work a little bit harder to use more carcass pieces because that's a more natural diet for our animals and we're always trying to get to a, as much of a natural diet as we can. So on this side, we have a little bit more of our fun stuff. This is some of our, these are some of our enrichment items. 
So you'll see here we have juice. We have different kinds of juice. We have apple, grape, prune, orange, and we can feed it to animals just like this. Mostly we'll dilute it and use it for training. If they do a good behavior, they'll get a juice as a reward. We have ketchup. Everybody wonders why we have ketchup. This is actually used for our orangutans behind the scenes. They will get the ketchup placed into a PVC pipe that they can't fit their arms in. And what they've learned is that they either use a stick or some fire hose or other tool to get the ketchup out. So we always try to make sure to have them use their brains to figure out how to get food. Some other items we have are different kinds of mixed nuts. We always give them to our animals whole so that way they have to work to get the the meat out just like they would um, in the wild. We have baby puffs, which I'm sure some of you recognize. This is a really great training treat, low calorie and flavorful so that our animals get that reward when they do a good behavior. We have regular baby food. We use this for animals that may be sick. We have to have lots of different kinds on stock because we never know if anybody's gonna get sick. And baby food tastes really good and has vitamins and minerals in it so that the animals will be enticed to eat. We use tuna for our bears as a reward for coming in or for getting weighed. They really, really, really like it. Unfortunately, our big cats do not. So unlike your domestic cat, our lions and tigers do not like tuna. You guys might have noticed we've got vitamins here, Flintstones and gummies. We use these a lot for our primates. It makes it easier to give them because a lot of our primates like these, so we can just hand it to them and they'll eat it. And it's a really good way to make sure that they get all the vitamins and minerals that they need to grow. Other things that we use for foraging for our primates and bears is cereal. So we have in stock, we have Cheerios. We also have Raisin Bran, Rice Krispies, and Corn Flakes. And the nice thing about these is they're very small and they can be spread around the exhibit. So again, it allows the animal to walk around and be active and engaged with their exhibit, trying to find different types of food. A similar, a similar uh, thing with the pasta, we can offer to them cooked or raw. So they like it either way. And again, it's something that we can spread throughout the exhibit and offer to them. Um, on, on a rotating basis. And then we're getting kind of down to the end here. We've got some rawhide bones. Mostly we use these for the bears. Um, we're not allowed to use them for our wolves because we have a special species of wolf here that can be reintroduced into the wild. So we're not allowed to give them anything artificial like this. So they only get uh, lot vertebrate prey. And then this one, I love this, this bone. This is a nice smoked bone from a cow. It's one that we'll give to our bears. And I know Hudson is notorious for taking this and banging it up against the wall until it breaks open because the marrow on the inside is the really good tasting stuff. But this is a nice big treat for them. I have a little bit miscellaneous stuff here. We use food coloring. People might wonder why we use food coloring, but if we're doing a study or trying to figure out um, if an animal might be sick, we can dye some of their food and then we're able to find the feces that belongs to that animal. So it's really good if we're doing studies or if we know one animal might be having GI upset that we can identify which animal it is. We also use some probiotics. We'll use that for some of our carnivores and some of our herbivores as well. And lastly, one of the things I always have to be ready for is if we have a pregnancy that the mom might reject the baby. So we always have to be ready no matter what. And so I have to be able to make formulas for all the different kinds of species of mammals. Now you have to remember we have three, over 350 different species of animals here, over 2,000 individuals. So this is a lot for us to do. It's a big job. I have five people that work for me on a daily basis. We work 24-7, and um, I'll be happy to take any questions now. 
Are you trained in animal nutrition or human nutrition? I am trained in animal nutrition. I got my bachelor's in animal science and my PhD in animal and veterinary nutrition. Is all the food prepared here in this kitchen? Not all of it. As you might notice, this kitchen is kind of small for feeding 2,000 animals. Um, this is actually the original commissary that was built in 1929. So it was built for a collection of 500 animals, not 2,000. So what we do is we make some diets here, but a lot of our diets are made in bulk and we ship them over to the kitchen at the animal building. And then the keepers will weigh out the individual amounts for each animal and cut it up or distribute it. And that way, um, each of the animals gets what they need. Which of the big cats or any of the cats eat fish? The big cats usually do not, but other fish, other cats like uh, fishing cats are specifically are ones that are eat, their diet is mostly fish. Sometimes um, we might feed it to other small cats like an ocelot um, as, an, as an enrichment, but mainly it's just the fishing cat that eats the majority of the fish. Who supplies the zoo with all of the different food? Oh, we have lots of different suppliers. Um, it's, it's interesting that there are suppliers for each one of these things and that's their job and they provide us with bugs and mice and hay. We use, um, for some of our hay, we use a local farm up in Michigan to, to give us the hay. All of the complete feeds come from a vendor that distributes certain products. Um, there is one company that specifically makes exotic animal complete feeds and so we use a lot of that. Our produce we get from uh, a restaurant quality, everything is inspected um, and gone through some specific quality control standards. So it's the same food that you would eat. Um, the only thing is, as you might have noticed, we get, we get the giant size stuff. You wouldn't see this carrot in your grocery store. We don't care what it looks like because the animals will eat it either way. So sometimes we can um, save a little bit of money by not getting what you might get at a restaurant, but just the next grade down. How do you know how much food an animal eats per day? Most of our animals, we, have, we weigh it in and out. Um, the majority of my job is figuring that out as to how much they're supposed to eat. For a lot of our animals, we don't even know what they're calorie needs are. So we're very um, basic here in that we'll feed them a diet. I'll know how many calories are in it. We weigh the animals on a very frequent basis and if they gain weight, I know that there's too many calories and if they lose weight, I know they need more. So if we have an animal like the pangolin who came in and we weren't quite sure what to feed them, how do you figure that out? So that's really interesting because we'll use uh, journal articles from people who have done research in the wild to try to determine what they'll eat. Uh, hopefully we've had some analysis done on some of the wild plants or animals that they'll eat to get an idea of what the nutrient composition is. As you might expect, we can't replicate any of our animals' natural diet. The next best thing we can do is analyze it and replicate the nutrients that they need to make sure that they stay healthy. How many pounds of food do you prepare every day? Oh my goodness. Um, if we count everything that gets put out, it's probably about 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. As what we actually prepare here is a little bit less, but if you count everything that we ship out, it's probably about that. Do you get food in fresh every day? Not every day. Our, um, our produce comes in twice a week, so we always do make sure that it is fresh. Uh, the meat and fish and things like that, depending on what it is, the meat will get every two months. The fish are a very special type of fish that only get caught once a year. So with those, I have to buy a year's worth, like 80,000 pounds at one time. And then we store it at a facility off-site and we get it delivered as we need it. Do you ever feed any um, live 
food besides the insects? In very special cases, we will sometimes feed live pinkies, and that's usually for snakes or other reptiles that have not eaten in a very long time and have not taken to eating frozen thawed prey. We try to keep it as uh, minimal time as possible and always have the keepers trying to get the, the animal to eat frozen prey, but sometimes we have to for the sake of the animal. How long does it take you to prepare the diets every day? My staff is very efficient. I have a great team here. So for the most part, everything is done within the first four to five hours of the day. We're, we start now at 6 a.m., so usually by about now, most of the stuff in the kitchen is done. We do some other kinds of miscellaneous delivering and inventory and things like that at the, at the end of the day. Do the animals usually eat in their public habitats or behind the scenes? Most of our animals eat behind the scenes. And the reason we do that is because we want our animals to come in for good food. And the other thing is that it helps us to control what each animal eats. If we put these really energy dense chows out on exhibit, one animal might hoard them all and nobody else will get it. That animal will end up getting overweight and not, and the other animals will not get the nutrition that they need. So we feed those, those kinds of things behind the scenes so that we can make sure everybody's getting exactly what uh, their diet says they need. Are any of the animals picky eaters? Oh yes. Uh, mammals especially, you have to think about all mammals have taste buds and these are all individual animals so um, the binturong have been notoriously picky, uh, the orangutans are, are picky too. One of the things we do that, that probably people do with their kids as well is when we have a baby, especially a baby orangutan or gorilla, we feed them all sorts of different fruits and vegetables to try to get them used to different fruits and not develop uh, preferences as picky as their mom might be. But yes, we've had animals, I've had Red River hogs that don't like apples and so I have to trade it to pears, um, or gorillas that don't like tomatoes or grapefruit. And so we have to make adjustments. We do make adjustments for that. Can you remind us what your uh, job title is? I am the Director of Nutrition. Are there any surprising diets? Um, something that you would, we wouldn't normally think that that particular animal would eat? I don't know. I mean, most of our animals eat similarly to what they would eat in the wild. Um, the only thing I can think of that's really hard to feed are our insectivorous animals because we don't have the ability to give them ants or termites or beetles. There's just no commercial uh, availability for those. So we have to feed them the complete diets and some people are surprised that we feed them a mixture of cat food and the insectivore diet, but um, that's simply because we just don't have the ability to give them a more natural diet. Do you ever have to hide the vitamins in food to get animals to eat them? Yes. We have, I didn't bring them out because they're um, special items, but we have things like applesauce, yogurt, jelly, all kinds of things that even the vitamins need to be hidden in because there are some animals that don't like the taste of them. Um, we had one primate that she would eat the gummy, but only if you washed the sugar off first. So, um, but we also use those items to hide medication, which is really important too. Do you give anything special to the animals on their birthdays? Usually we do. Um, if you guys noticed, we had a little party for Raisin, our sloth yesterday. It was her fifth birthday, and so she got a little cupcake. But for most of our animals, we do try to make at least a little bit of a, a further milestone birthdays. We try to make a little bit of a, a special cake for them. Uh, does the zoo accept any donations of food? Unfortunately, no. Um, 
We have a very strict quality control procedure here and we need to know where our food has been at all times because we have very special animals and we don't want anything to, to upset them. So we want to make sure that all of our, our food is clean. Um, it is kind of unfortunate. I, I do get asked about donations quite often. Um, but one of the things you can do if you would like to don't to, to help feed the animals is either go through our Share the Care program and adopt an animal or just help out by donating to CZS.org. Um, where do we get the deer carcasses from? They actually come from a USDA facility up in Wisconsin. Um, so again, we have strict quality control measures. One of the, that is actually one of the things we do accept donations from during hunting season. We will accept bow uh, hunted deer and we have a gentleman that has been doing that for a few years for us, uh, bringing us when he, um, gets, when he gets a deer, we'll, we'll, don't, we'll use that as a donation. We have a lot of browsers yes. here at the zoo. Uh, where do we get the browse from? Oh, awesome question, because I forgot to talk about that. So we, um, during the summer, we've had a relationship with ComEd, actually, for the last, uh, this will be the 10th year, I think. And what they do is, during the summer, they bring all the tree trimmings that they've been trimming uh, proactively to help prevent power outages and they bring those to us so that we can um, give them out to the animals. It's a really awesome program that we've had. It provides us with lots and lots of browse, which is really the most natural type of food that we can provide for our animals. And it's been just really wonderful. One of the things that we also have learned is that if we vacuum seal the browse and freeze it, we can actually store it and be able to feed it to the animals in wintertime. So that's a really cool, uh, program that we've been having. Okay, well, it's been really fun talking to you guys. I love talking to people about this because everybody's really curious about what animals eat. And um, we hope to see you tomorrow.